Northside Christian Church. It's great to be back. I give you greetings from Midtown Church in Sacramento, California, but I've been here so many times now that I don't feel like a guest or a stranger, so good to see my brothers, my sisters, my cousins, my nieces, nephews, and them. So great to be back here at Northside. And, and I can really tell that I'm not a guest, I guess, anymore because you gave me a real, like, easy question to deal with this week. Was Jesus political? Wow. Wow. Okay. So we're going to dive into that today. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I, when I think about this, this question, was Jesus political? I mean, of course, I, I think about that the reason I'm able to stand before you today as one who can more fully participate in the democracy in our nation is because of a time when the church went public and stepped into politics through the civil rights movement. I, I also think of ways in which uh, the, the, the church has, 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 has brought the good news of the gospel to bear in various expressions of politics. But today, I actually want to take a different take on this question by going to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. There's a word for us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. It says this, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, How Jesus Navigates the Hypocrisy of Politics and Religion how Jesus navigates the hypocrisy of politics and religion. God, I pray that this would be your message, that ultimately I would just be a vessel, a vehicle that you would use to say what you want to say. To these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers, God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. How Jesus navigates the hypocrisy of politics and religion. Uh, politics at its best is the ability to participate in a democracy where you have a vote, where you're not under a tyrant, you're not under a dictator, you're not under a forever earthly human king, but you get to participate in a political process that leads to servant leadership. That's the hope, that's politics at its best. Religion at its best is when a collection of people can come together to worship God. God, to worship God without fear of being arrested or tortured or abused, persecuted, oppressed in this collection of people coming to worship God. This is a picture of politics and religion at its best, but politics and religion at its worst is when what is declared doesn't line up with what is demonstrated. What is preached doesn't line up with what is practiced. That's how hypocrisy comes to rise up when there's something different. There's a gap. There's a chasm between what we say and what we are doing. Because sisters and brothers, there's a problem with do as I say, not as I do especially when it enters into politics and religion. It can be a problem. Now, there might be some expressions of do as I say, uh, you know, not as I do, that aren't as harmful. Like, like I think of um, when I was growing up, and I'm going to tell this story about my dad, and sometimes when my mom and dad know I'm here, like they watch, you know, online, and what's up to all the online people out there. And so, Dad, if you're watching, I'm sorry, I'm throwing you under the bus a little bit here, but, but forgive me, I, I, I love you. Uh, but uh, my dad raised me and my siblings to not lie. He said, do not lie. If you did something wrong, we can deal with it. Just don't lie. If you broke the vase, say you broke the vase. If you left the refrigerator door open and the food is starting to spoil, just say you forgot to close it all the way. Just don't lie, don't lie. So my, my siblings and I, we were like, you don't lie, you tell the truth. And, and then there was one Saturday uh, when the Jehovah Witnesses came by our house looking for my mama. 
And so the Jehovah Witnesses came up to the door and they rang the doorbell and my mom ran into the bedroom and closed the door. And they kept ringing the doorbell. So my dad went and he opened the door and they said, hello, is Sandra Smith here? And he said, no, she is not. <laughs> Little kid, I didn't know no better. I said, yes, she is, dad. She just ran into the bedroom. <laughs> he said, I said, she's not here. So then in Jedi form, I said, she is not here. <laughs> in that moment, my dad didn't practice what he preached. He said one thing and did something else, but hey, no harm, no foul. It wasn't a big deal. Nobody got hurt. It just, you know, well, you know. But sometimes, sisters and brothers, when the stakes are higher, when the impact affects so many people, there is a problem with do as I say, not as I do. I live in California, so I remember the height of COVID. And you know, it was like stay in the house and only come out of the house for necessary things. And when you come out of the house, wear your mask. And so the governor of my state of California was like, stay in the house, only come out if it's absolutely necessary. And when you come out of the house, wear your mask, stay in the house, Wear your mask. And then a picture came out of the governor of California at a swank restaurant, 20 deep, sitting around a table. Nobody was wearing a mask. They was just in there smacking and eating. It was COVID. <laughs> he said one thing. But he did, so I'm sorry, I'm throwing my own governor under the bus. And I went from my dad to the governor. See how I did that? <laughs> there are times, sisters and brothers, where do as I say, not as I do, can have a tremendous impact. This is hypocrisy. This is why there are so many people today questioning all of the institutions in our society, including the church. But Christ calls you and I in the midst of political and religious hypocrisy, God calls you and I to a radical love, a love for God, a love for one another, and a courageous willingness to stand in truth in a broken, sinful, upside-down world. Ah, uh, yes, as we wrestle with the question, was Jesus political? It leads us to wrestle with following Jesus in navigating a political and religious world that is infected by sin. So um, this word, hypocrisy, because I keep using it, right? It comes from a Greek word, hypocrites, which means to wear a mask. It means living a performance. It means to wear a mask and to judge at the same time. So this word, the root word for hypocrisy comes from this expression of you're wearing a mask and you're judging other people. While you're not fully being who you are supposed to be, you are judging other people. This comes from the Greek symbols for theater. And so maybe you've seen the symbols where there's two masks and one mask is frowning and one mask is smiling. And so this word, hypocrites, where we get uh, hypocrisy in our culture is this, this understanding that you're not truly being you. You're wearing a mask. And in Greek theater, it was normal for there to be an actor playing many roles. So they would go from wearing one mask to wearing another mask to wearing another mask, all in the same show, all in the same play. And so when we are wearing a mask, sisters and brothers, we are living beneath who God has called us to be. And maybe we've been socialized to wear a mask and we have a, a work mask and a family mask and a neighborhood mask and a school mask, a manhood mask and a womanhood mask. We have various masks that we wear in the world. But I just want to give you this side note, sisters and brothers, you do not have to wear a mask. Some people wear a mask because they feel that's how they're going to be worthy. That's how they're going to be loved. That's how they're going to be accepted. But Christians don't need to wear a mask because you're already loved. You were born made in the image of God. You were born loved by God. You're born gifted by God. You're born with a purpose. You don't have to put on a mask. You don't have to perform. You just have to live out God's promise.
But yet in this sinful, broken world, there are people that are tempted to wear a mask. And so hypocrisy doesn't just have to work itself out in politics or religion. It can work itself out in a home. It can work itself out in a broken soul that is not fully sure if they can be who they really are. But yet Jesus, in a political and religious world, exposes hypocrisy. We're looking at the Gospel of Matthew and Matthew, the author of this gospel, was a tax collector and a follower of Jesus. That right there smells of hypocrisy, but we won't deal with that. Matthew's purpose in this gospel was to introduce Jesus as king, Messiah, and savior. Do you know that from birth, Jesus was a serious threat to the culture and power of both political and religious leaders? From the moment Jesus was born, it was political. What do I mean by this? When Jesus was born, the political leader in his area decided to kill every baby that looked like Jesus. Jesus and his family had to flee into another country for that, and, and because it, it was political from the very beginning and it was religious. And so Jesus faced opposition from religious leaders and political leaders. Jesus exposed the hypocrisy. Well, how is it that politics and religion becomes hypocritical in the first place. It's because of sin. Sin is in the soul of individual human beings. Sin is in society and institutions and structures. And sin ultimately is in Satan. And Jesus exposes all of this brokenness, the ways in which people and institutions masquerade by wearing the mask. Even Shakespeare once said, God hath given you one face, and yet you make for yourselves another one. Maybe Jesus is exposing hypocrisy so that you and I would say yes to holiness, that we would say yes to righteousness, that we would say yes to truth, that we would say yes to biblical justice, that we would say yes to reconciliation, to to God in Christ Jesus and into right relationship with one another. So how does this happen? How do we follow Jesus in such a way that the church rises out of political and religious hypocrisy. That's where we're going right now. So I got three points for you. All that other stuff, that was appetizers. So now that we got the tater tots and the buffalo wings, out of, now that we got the nachos with steak on it out the way, now we can get to the collard greens, macaroni and cheese, yams, fried catfish, cornbread, peach cobbler, and sweet tea. I, all right, maybe I'm not in the right house. I don't know. That's, that's how we eat where I'm from. But, all right, I, amen. Thank you. There's one spirit filled catfish brother in the house. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. How does the church rise out of political and religious hypocrisy? Number one, by putting relationships over politics and religion. Matthew chapter 23, I'm actually going to start at verse 1 and go all the way through verse 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their uh, phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one in instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you. Wow, wow, Jesus. Man, when Jesus is cussing, we should pay attention. Wow. <laughs> so what is Jesus saying here? He's saying you can't trust these religious leaders. Why? Because they're more focused on celebrity than sanctification. They're more interested in the power of leading institutions than they are expressing intimacy with God. I, I, I want to help the, the, the kids in here real quick when it says, you know, do not call anyone father. Well, let me, let me clean up what that means because I don't want you to go home and tell your dad, Pastor Ephraim said, I don't have to call you father anymore. Dude. Good luck with that. Uh, that. That's not what I'm saying. What, I'm, what, what Jesus is saying here is this religious and political exalting that you see of men in front of you, be careful of it, it is idolatrous. There's one heavenly father, there's one king of kings, there's one Lord, there's one God, and no human being should use political or religious position or office as a power place to become God-like. There's one God, there's one heavenly Father. Be careful of this. We, we, we must put relationships over politics and religion. What, do I, what am I trying to say? Our relationship with God and our relationship with others ought to speak louder than our preaching about God and preaching about others. Uh, we ought to take serious that if we've claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we might not yet be in political alignment. We might not yet be in alignment in terms of all of our rituals and, and traditions around religion. I mean, this church might have people that come from a Baptist background and a Pentecostal background and a Lutheran background and a Methodist background and a Baptist background background. There could be people coming from all different kinds of religious traditions, but, but through Christ Jesus, we're one family, and we ought to worship God together, and we ought to let the Word of God bring us into such a dynamic unison that we're not driven into unity by politics or by religion, but by the Creator of the universe, by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who reconciles all through the cross. We ought to put our intimate relationship with God first. We ought to put our reconciled relationships in Christ Jesus before all of the other ideologies and institutions that, that seek to split us up, polarize us, and divide us. Putting relationships over politics and religion. Point two, by putting biblical justice over earthly judgment. Matthew 25, Jesus describes entering into the kingdom of God in this way. In verse 31 of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Sisters and brothers, let me make one thing clear. Justice is not salvific. So doing biblical justice work doesn't save you. But how can you be saved and not explore and express biblical justice? 
I used to think, sisters and brothers, before diving into this text, I thought that all you had to do was just individually accept Jesus Christ into your heart, and now you have your heavenly insurance and assurance plan, and you can just sit around and wait until it's your time to go meet God and glory. But yet between the time that we say yes to Jesus Christ and we meet Jesus face to face in heaven, there is work for us to do. There is biblical works of righteousness and justice that we are called to. We are not saved by these works. We are saved by grace and faith in Christ Jesus. And yet we are called to these works. What do these works look like? Love for the most vulnerable among us. The Bible seems to be clear from Isaiah to Micah to Jeremiah that we are to care for the orphan, the widow. We are to care for the poor, the needy. But yet, if we explore books like Jeremiah, we are to care about the unborn. The the Bible is clear. that what, What does the Bible mean when it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, which means before we are a visible being in the natural realm, God is already designing and crafting who we would be in an invisible realm. And we must not disrupt this as followers of Christ, as believers in the word of God. We must care about the most vulnerable among us, and we should not need a politician to call us to this. The word of God should call us to this. We should put biblical justice and righteousness over earthly judgment. Sometimes we slander people more than we serve them. We must bring good news to sinners and not constant commentary about their sins. This is where the hypocrisy comes in. When the church spends too much time just commentating on sin and not engaging the lives of sinners, we can become those hypocrites where we're wearing a mask to cover up our own weaknesses, our, other, our own sins, while we point the finger of those that are uh, committing sins that we don't commit. So we must love them. We must bring the truth to them. We must bring the good news to them. Our job is not to draw lines in the sand and make enemies out of sinners. Our job is to love sinners. Putting biblical justice and righteousness over earthly judgment. And then finally, sisters and brothers, how does the church follow Jesus and rise out of political and religious hypocrisy? One, by putting relationships over politics and religion. Two, by putting biblical justice over earthly judgment. And three, by putting eternity over empire. Putting eternity over empire. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says these words, beginning in verse 5. He says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Putting eternity over empire. There's two things that are important here. One is a connection to heaven and a calling upon heaven. A connection to heaven and a calling upon heaven. So Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites. Don't just stand in the public and babble and try to impress people with your prayers. That's not the kind of praying that we're being called to. It's an intimate connection with God. It's an intimate connection with the kingdom of God, heaven. 
I, I, I want to uh, confess something to you here, and it's going to sound strange because my background is Baptist. I grew up in a predominantly African-American Baptist church, and I'm also evangelical. I pastor in an evangelical denomination now and pastor a very diverse, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-racial church. And so I'm, I'm Baptist and evangelical, uh, but, but here's my confession. I pray in tongues. Now, now, I don't know if there's a few Pentecostals here, but, um, but w when I do this, I do not do it in public. And, and I'm not here to, to, to preach on tongues and if everybody should do it or not, that, that's, that, that's not my, my point. Because um, I was shocked when this happened to me. I was a senior in college. I was in my dorm room by myself. I was going through some things. I was crying out to God with tears in my eyes. I'm praying. And the next thing I knew, it happened. And... And, and that's how it's been in, in my life. Uh, that has been a personal connection to God. It has been an expression of my intimate. You need to find your own. What, what God is calling all of us to is an intimate communication, an intimate connection to God. What does that look like for you? For you, that might mean being alone and putting on some worship music. It might be going on a walk by yourself and just having a silent moment with God. It could be just listening, looking at creation and being reminded that God created the heavens and and the earth, but we all should find our own intimate connection to heaven, to the kingdom of God. How we rise above the governments and institutions and ideologies of this world is by having a practice of being connected to heaven because that's where you're going. But when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you realize that's where you're from. Your citizenship ultimately is not just a citizenship in your earthly nation. Citizenship in the United States of America is a reality, but it's not your eternity. Your eternity is your citizenship in the kingdom of God. So we should live as if we're not from here. You're not from here. So women, you are, think of yourself as Wonder Woman. So you know, like Wonder Woman, she's not from here. She's from some other place. It's like a, 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 an island full of wonder women. I don't know how that works out because it's just women there, but I, I'm not getting into the theology of that. But, but just go with me. The Diana Princess is not from here. She's from another realm. And she has a gift that when you're in her presence, you cannot lie. You have to tell the truth. Men, you are Superman. Superman is not from here. His earthly name is Clark Kent, but that's not who he is. He really goes by, he is the son of Jarrell. He's from another realm, and he's here for a purpose. He's here for a mission. And the whole story arc of Superman is Superman trying to discover who he's to be in this realm, in this earth. And that's who we're to be as Christians, to be Wonder Women and Supermen. We're not from here. We're citizens of the kingdom of God, and we are here. And the reality is we're citizens of the United States of America, but our eternity is not predicated on that. It is connected to heaven. That's the connection. And then there's the call, which means every time we pray, we should be calling on heaven to show up here. That eternity would come to bear on all government systems in the United States of America. We are here to be salt and light. Jesus did not come to earth to become Caesar of the Roman Empire. He did not come. He disappointed Peter because he did not show up to say, I'm going to put an army together and we're going to take over the Roman Empire and I will be Caesar and it will be different now. You won't have to worry about Pontius Pilate. You won't have to worry about Herod. You won't have to worry about Caesar because we're going to take the government. This is what we're going to do. Let's go. Jesus says, no, I've come to proclaim the kingdom of God. I've come to share my father, and my father and I are one, and I'm calling you to this kingdom. Will you say yes to it? Will we put eternity over empire? There are visible kingdoms, but they are kingdoms of this world, and their power is outside for a moment, 
But there's an invisible kingdom, and this is who we're to be, who we're to represent as the church, and the power is on the inside. It's been given through the Holy Spirit. It's been given by the grace of God. Sisters and brothers, the church is not to be a mouthpiece for political parties. It's to be an embassy of the kingdom of God. We ought to be a place where people come in to the church and they experience the love of the kingdom of God. They experience the truth of the kingdom of God. They experience the righteousness of the kingdom of God. And we take this truth and this love and this righteousness, this holiness, this justice from the word of God and we take it public. We take it to the marketplace. We take it to the government halls. We take it to the schools. We take it to the hospitals. We take it to the streets. We take it to the farms. We take it to dirt roads and concrete until such time as Jesus returns, you and I are to be the vehicles of God's love in a broken world. This is our calling. So sisters and brothers, as I come to my close, I was supposed to answer the question, was Jesus political? Well, to navigate the question, was Jesus political? You'd have to wrestle with, is God political? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is the word that was with God, was God in the beginning, and nothing came into being without him. That's John chapter 1. To ask, was Jesus political? You'd have to say, well, well, I do know this. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I know he's Savior. I know he's Messiah. I know he's Prince of Peace. I know he's Alpha. I know he's Omega. I know he's a balm in Gilead. I know he's a wheel in the middle of the wheel. I know he's healing. I know he's victorious. I know he's triumphant. I know he's God all by himself. I know he has all power. I know he has all authority. I know that there's reconciliation and sanctification in him. If he's political, he's a good politician. He's the best politician, but you don't have to vote for him because he's already been exalted by his father in heaven. There ain't no caucus. There ain't no convention. There ain't no party. There ain't no elephant and there ain't no donkey, but there is a lamb in the center of it all who gives his glory to us for such a time as this. Is God political? You ought to ask Pharaoh when, he, when God set the Israelites free. Is God political? You ought to ask Nebuchadnezzar when he thought he could throw Daniel in a lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. Yet God disrupted the public policy of King Nebuchadnezzar and brought Daniel out of a lion's den and brought three brothers out of a fire fiery furnace. Is God political? You ought to ask Haman who tried to kill all the Jewish people but God sent Esther to the king and not one was harmed. Is God political? I know he's got a kingdom. I know he has all glory and we ought to surrender and say yes to a God like that. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, we ought to participate in the democracy. Too much blood was shed for us not to. How could I not vote when I think of those who risk their lives so I can? When I think about those that defend our nation today so I can? You should vote. You should participate. You should go prayed up. But yet and still, you should remember every single day that you are a citizen of a kingdom where there is no war, there is no poverty, there is no disease, there is no prejudice, there is no bias, there is everlasting peace. And this peace ought to fuel us to navigate politics and religion every single day. God, I pray that this church would be an embassy of your kingdom. That in New Albany, in the Louisville metropolitan area, around the world, this church would be a remnant of your beloved children bringing truth and grace, biblical justice and righteousness to the lost, to the broken, to the hurting. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, sisters and brothers.
If you need additional prayer, just stay seated where you are and there are people from the prayer team that will come to you. And once again, I just want to thank you for allowing me to be here once again with y'all. Love you, family.